Greetings, Remnant Church and online congregation. Welcome to this week's Midweek Refuel, where we seek out the old and ancient writings and paths so that we might benefit spiritually from their experiences and from their testimonies. Um, please take a moment and hit the like and the subscribe button. It really does help us out, and I thank you for helping us to grow as a ministry. We've, we've seen uh, uh, a good bit of growth in the last couple of months, and uh, I, uh, I credit you with that, so thank you very much. Uh, we completed Book 9 of the Confessions just last week. I hope you tuned in and saw that. This is going to build on that lesson. So this week, we are entering into Book 10, and the tone of Book 10 is decidedly different than the tone of the last few chapters, if not the, the, the previous book as a whole. Augustine, for quite some time now, has focused on his mother, his mother's influence on his own life, and of course the passing away of his mother from this life into the eternal or into the next. We have traveled with him, with Augustine, through his immature years. We have heard his confessions of both the good things and the bad things that he's done in this life. He's been, he's been quite honest. We have watched him weep over his mother. We have watched him weep over the death of his son. And uh, we have watched him weep over his own spiritual condition. And now, in Book 10, we enter into a whole new phase of life and a whole new phase of spiritual existence. Augustine has found God. Time to get to know God. Knowing God, whether you know it or not, is the primal question of the prime questions. Ahead of questions like, who am I or why am I here? All those questions tend to hinge on the uber question or the meta question, which is, what is God? Uh, I questioned whether I should ask, who is God? Out of respect, it, it sounds better. And using that instead of, what is God? But when we first truly formulate the God question or the God dynamic, the God shape within our psyches, the question of what supersedes the question of who, simply because you must understand first what kind of a thing, if a thing it be at all, are you trying to know and actually have a living relationship with? Is God a thing? Or is he a creator of things? If he is the creator of things, then does that mean that he is incapable of being a thing, as I imagine things to be? If he created things, then he is not a thing himself. And if all that be true, then can I even have a relationship with this thing, which is not a thing, but creates things? How do I describe God? Well, I describe him simply as not this and not that. Uh, you might think these are superfluous questions, but we do it all the time, don't we? we? We change how and why we interact with each other and with each new relationship that we form, uh, whether with a, uh, a pet or a president. My relationship with the cat is very different than my relationship with my child. My relationship with my child is very different than the one I have with my pastor. And the relationship uh, with my pastor is light years different than the relationship that I have with my wife. So if I am to know God, then I must know, I must try to know what kind of a thing he is, or at least come to terms with him not being a thing at all, but rather a creator of things, something he is above and in charge of. The best way to talk about him is to use metaphysical language, even though that fails to grasp him, because you never really want to grasp him. You want to know him like you know anybody in a relationship. What you do not want to do is build an idol that he is like all the time. You, you do not want to build a false image of him. He is living and breathing. An image is still and stagnant. Uh, so the language we're going to use is metaphysical. Physicality itself, as nearly every religion out there will tell you, emanates out of or flows from or is created by, those are very important distinctions, created by 
this metaphysical being. He is the source of order, and he is the lawgiver. Let me read how the uh, Holy Scriptures puts this concept. In the book of John, it's written, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made, not emanated. All things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent nor of a human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. Let me break some of that down for you. And I am really hoping that some of this discussion will break the chains and bondage of witchcraft in the new age in at least one person who's listening today. If that's you, I'm praying for you. If you are into a Gnostic-leaning cult or a Gnostic-leaning religion, then please pay attention to the different ways in which the Bible speaks of the Godhead as compared to how Gnostics, uh, Gnostic forms of thought conceive of Keter or Kether. Gnostic thought now, as then, is deceptively similar to Christianity. Gnostic thought believes that the world came into, ex into creation, into existence, through the emanations of God, like uh, uh, dropping a rock in, a, in an ocean, and that these emanations are also an intimate part of God himself. They are not separate. The waves are not separate from God. They are God in Gnostic thought. Christians are told, through the Holy Scriptures, that God did indeed create, not emanate, that he did indeed create, but that his creation is separate from him. Quote, in the beginning, God created, unquote. Creation is a very different thing than emitting. God did not have uh, reality flow naturally from his very being. He rather actively chose to speak it into existence. It is part of the reason that Judeo-Christianity calls God Father. A, a father is uniquely separate from the birthing and creative process. So for you feminazis and SJWs out there that are looking for every hint of patriarchal conspiracies, please stay out of the way and out of the theological studies department. When we speak of male and female, in the spirit realm, we are speaking about the archetypes of order and chaos, not what your um, professor of queer dance theory taught you about gender. Christians are told that the kingdom is within. New Age folks are told that God himself is within. In Hindu religions, they steeple their fingers and uh, together and place them in front of the chest or the forehead, nod and say namaste, or more clearly spelled out and defined, namaste means the divine in me bows to the divine in you. Well, we Christians don't believe that we contain any d d divinity by virtue of our humanity. We were made in the image of God, but there's a far cry uh, from being a sofa or an ottoman uh, or a love seat and claiming to be made of God stuff. Uh, the Bible does tell us in Ephesians chapter 3, quote, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, unquote. Christ coming to dwell with you in your very heart, no doubt is an intimate relationship. No doubt is intimate beyond description, but not so intimate that you were born that way. Christ coming is a function of grace and repentance aligning 
properly or correctly. Christianity promises to restore until the day of Christ himself, the broken image of God that you were meant to be. Listen to 2 Corinthians 5, 17, quote, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here, unquote. Gnosticism is very much about finding this or locating that or knowing secret and hidden things. Gnosticism, what I know of it, is steeped in language that indicates that you were a god who just forgot that you are a god. Well, if that were true, can we at least admit to each other that we don't make very impressive gods? (laughs) If you can remember that you were a god, all will be well. I forget which lesson it was, but in my time of following the lives of certain Gnostic and Satanic leaders, not following them, but just following their lives and their story out of sheer morbid curiosity, uh, nearly every time all did not end well for them. Christianity is about not just restoring life, but also creating something new within you, giving you life for the very first time. It is this new thing that is created within you that begins the work of restoring all the other aspects of your life. I say that Jesus will help you know yourself and that he will help you to achieve the shape that God desired for you from the very beginning. Jesus will help you to find God's will for your life. Gnostic teachings will tell you that Somewhere within the darkness of your own inner landscape, there lies just waiting to be found your true will. Uh, And if you can learn this true will, then you will be a spiritually fulfilled and enlightened person. Now, in Christianity, we look to the scriptures, we look to tradition, and we look to the guidance of the Holy Spirit that has been sent to us to help us to find God's will for us every moment. Crowley says, do what thou wilt. Jesus says, not my will, but thine. Gnosticism yearns to find itself. Christianity yearns to join Christ in his death so that we might also share in his resurrection. Gnosticism says, Do the work, learn the right things, work this spell or act out this ceremony properly. You'll figure it out. Christianity says, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourself. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast, unquote. How do you know Christian revelation from Gnostic meanderings? Well, very simple, to tell the truth. The times when I have been most in tune with God and God's Spirit, He gave me something in those moments. He gave me something precious, something which I did not have before. Uh, It didn't require that I get fixed. It required that I die. It did not require that I be repaired. It required that I be given a spirit worth fixing. It didn't want to revive me. It wanted to crucify me so that I might join Him in death and join join him in resurrection. It didn't want to repair me. It wanted to rework me from the ground up. Now, that's not to say I haven't had aha moments. I have had aha moments while studying theology and Gnosticism, to be honest with you. But anything truly worth anything has always been given to me freely through no credit of my own by the hand of Almighty God himself. He gave me peace. He gave me salvation. He gave me freedom, courage, and sanctification. And all he wanted in return was for me to relinquish my shame, my guilt, my rebellious nature into his hands. Good deal. If you are out there and you feel like you have no purpose in life, quit trying to find your purpose for crying out loud and instead start answering that still small voice that is reaching out to you from out there somewhere. Gnosticism says to turn the inner uh, inner eye to uh, within to find answers. Christianity says that you will find nothing with the inner eye but darkness. Not the little voice you communicate with all the time. Not that voice. Not the voice of the standard inner monologue that most of us have. But that other voice, you know the one I'm talking about, sometimes separating the spirit within, consciousness, from the gift of the comforter, the Holy Spirit and gift of Christ from without, 
can be and is as subtle as the difference between Gnosticism and Christianity. Subtle, but significant. Just like a decimal place on your check register uh, seems insignificant until the bank calls with a problem. There is so much richness in these chapters today. Uh, I wish I could teach longer. Listen as we now read how Augustine addresses his communication in the spiritual realm to something or someone outside and other than himself. He isn't looking within for answers. He is pleading without for revelation. Quote, but you, O oh my inner physician, make clear to me, I pray, my prophet, in doing all this, unquote. Or, quote, for what is it to hear about oneself from you if not to recognize oneself, unquote. Gnosticism says, know thyself, while Christianity says, get on the potter's wheel and not let God tell you who and what you are, unquote. I, I hate to say it, but one of my favorite descriptions uh, of atheist, uh, descriptions of atheists and agnostics come straight out of the mouth of a Satanist, <laughs> a sharp Satanist, but a Satanist all the same. I like his definition of these two or his description of atheists and agnostics. A at least, at least a Satanist is smart enough to realize that there is a spiritual realm. Uh, or, or ha well, half of the Satanists, uh, ha the other half is uh, atheist, so he's describing both of them. He says, uh, this is Michael Aquino, he says, quote, the absence of any supernatural morality, including a posthumous reward, punishment for incarnate behavior, makes sincere atheists that much more dangerous to others <laughs> as they are motivated only by sensual gratification. Some may, of course, derive pleasure from kindness, but others, just as whimsically, may enjoy depravity, torture, murder. Indeed, the entire spectrum of sensual, sensual gratification has nowhere a moral governor. The overriding goal is relief from boredom of being forced to confront the futility of a meaningless consciousness, unquote. He is even more scathing of agnostics who lack the fortitude to make decisions when evidence is clear. He writes of them, quote, just as glaringly, this but begs the question because the intricacy, consistency, realities are every bit as visible and inescapable to them. All they demonstrate by their refusal to confront the question is their fear that the obvious answer will doom them to creationist ridicule in supercilious atheist circles. Thus, they succeed only in emulating ostriches, unquote. Yeah, you guessed right. I believe Satanists to be intellectually head and shoulders above atheists. Think about this. Just linguistically, if you wish, atheists cannot exist without God. Atheists are fighting, atheists are fighting a grammar problem. Uh, not an existential problem or an ontological problem. They are fighting a grammar problem. Atheists say that God does not exist, and they feel so proud saying it. Well, they're right, and they're dead wrong. God is that thing which creates out of nothing things themselves. God is that no thing which creates things out of nothing. Hmm. <laughs> He supersedes existence and is above and over it. He is something more than a thing. He is the maker of all things. He is something higher than reality. He is that no thing through which the logos reaches its telos. Listen again to John chapter 1, quote, in the beginning was the logos, and the logos was with God, and the logos was God. Logos is the divine principle or pattern through which the cosmos is ordered. This order, a natural law, this ordering of the cosmos is intelligent and this ordering of the cosmos is intentional. The Logos sets up a system in which humans and any other sentient spiritual beings may reach their spiritual telos. Logos is the pattern and the order of the universe as it is and as it advances through time and to which it bows. 
Telos is the goal for which the Logos was designed to take the cosmos. The Logos is Christ. The Telos is your redemption and the final division of good and evil. Logos is the map of North Carolina. Telos is the ultimate goal that the route on the GPS takes you through that map. So let us turn to the beginning of Book 10. And if you need a copy, you can find it online with a simple DuckDuckGo search, or you can just click the link below uh, to go straight to Project Gutenberg, where you can get uh, a whole library uh, of books, including this one, and they're all for free. It's a wonderful site. Uh, I encourage you to check it out. And like I say, we are in Chapter 1 of our new book, 10. May I know you, my knower? May I know you, even as I also am known? Strength of my soul, enter that soul and fit it for yourself, that you may inhabit and dwell therein, and it may be free from spot or wrinkle. This is my hope, and therefore I speak, and in that hope I rejoice whenever I rationally rejoice. As for the other things of this life, the more one weeps for them, the less they should be wept for, and the less they are wept for, the more they should be wept for. Behold, you have loved truth, since he that does what is true comes to the light. It is my purpose in making my confession in my heart to do what is true before you and in making my confession in writing to do what is true before many witnesses. But what is there in me that could remain hidden from you, O Lord, to whose eyes the depths of a man's conscience lies bare, even if I refuse to confess it to you? I would be hiding you from me, not me from you. As things are, however, my groaning is testimony that I take no pleasure in myself, but you shine on me, and I take pleasure in you, whom I love and long for. So may I blush for myself, cast myself aside, and choose you instead, being pleasing neither to you nor to myself, unless that pleasure comes from you. To you, O Lord, I stand revealed, whatever I may be. My prophet, in confessing to you, I have spoken. I do it not with words and utterances of the flesh, but with words of the soul, with the outcry of my thought that is known to your ears. Insofar as I am evil, confessing to you is nothing other than taking no pleasure in myself. Insofar as I perform my pious duty, confessing to you is nothing other than not ascribing this fact to myself. For it is you, O Lord, who bless the just, but first you make just the impious. The confession that I make in your sight, O Lord, is both silent and vocal. It is silent in that it makes no sound. It is vocal in my feelings. I say nothing right before men that you have not heard from me first, do, nor do you hear any such thing from me that you have not told me first. What business then do I have with men that they should hear my confession as if they were the ones who would heal all my iniquities? They are an inquisitive breed, eager to learn of other people's lives, full of idleness when it comes to amending their own. Why do they seek to hear from me what I am when they refuse to hear from you what they are? And when they hear me speaking of myself, how do they know whether what I say is true, seeing as no man knows what goes on in a man except the man's spirit that is within him? But if they were to hear about themselves from you, they would not be able to say, the Lord is lying. For what is it to hear about oneself from you if not to recognize oneself? And who could recognize himself and say, it is false, were he not himself lying? But since love believes all things, at least among those whom it makes one, joined together to itself, I too, O Lord, confess even so to you that men to whom I cannot show whether I am telling the truth may hear me. Those whose ears have been opened to me by love will believe me. But you, O oh my inner physician, make clear to me, I pray, my prophet, in doing all this. As for the confessions of my past wickedness, those that you have forgiven and covered, blessing me in you, changing my soul by faith and by your sacrament, these confessions, when read and heard, stir up the heart, lest it should slumber in despair and say, I cannot, so that it should rather wake up in the love of your mercy and the sweetness of your grace, which makes strong every sick man who through that grace becomes conscious of his own sickness. The good, too, find delight in hearing of those who committed wicked deeds in the past, but are now free from them. Nor are they delighted because those deeds were evil, but because they were and are no more. 
What profit, therefore, my Lord, to whom my conscience daily confesses, more confident in the hope of your mercy than in its own integrity? Tell me, what profit do I have in confessing before men also in your presence and through this writing what I still am and not what I was? I have seen and set down my profit from the latter, but what I still am, even as I write these confessions, there are many who would know that those who have known me and not known me, and those who have heard something from me or of me, but whose ears cannot hear my heart, where I am whoever I am. They wish, therefore, to hear it from my own confession, what I am within in the part inaccessible to their eyes and ears and minds. They wish to do so, however, because they will believe me. Otherwise, what would they learn? The love through which they are good tells them that I am not lying in my confession of myself, and that love in them believes me. But what profit do they have in wishing to hear of me? Do they wish to share in my thanksgiving when they hear that progress you have granted me to make towards you? Do they wish to pray for me when they hear how much I have been slowed down by the burden of myself? To such people I will make myself known. It is no slight profit, O Lord, if many give thanks to you for my sake, and that many pray to you for my sake. Let some brotherly spirit love that in me which you teach should be loved, and mourn for that in me which you teach should be mourned. Let it be some brotherly spirit who does this, not a stranger's, not one of the foreign children whose mouth speak van speaks vanity and whose right hand is a right hand of iniquity. Let it be a brotherly spirit who, in finding good in me, rejoices over me, and in finding fault in me, is full of sorrow over me. To such I will make myself known. Let them sigh with relief over my good things and with sorrow over my bad things. My good things are your statutes and your gifts. My bad things are my sins and your judgments. Let them sigh with relief for the former, with sorrow for the later, and let songs of praise and lamentation arise in your presence from the hearts of my brethren, those vessels full of incense offered to you, and you, O Lord, that take delight in the fragrance of your holy temple, have mercy upon me according to your great mercy, for your own name's sake. You who have never abandoned what you have begun, bring to fulfillment the things in me that are imperfect. This is the profit I have of my confessions, that I should confess not what I was, but what I am, and confess it not only before you with secret exultation and trembling and secret grief and hope, but also in the ears of those children of men who believe. These are my companions in my rejoicing and the sharers of my mortality, my fellow citizens and fellow pilgrims, those that have gone before me, those that will come after me, those that come with me. These are your servants, my brethren, those children of yours who it is your will should be my masters whom you have bade me serve if it is my will to live with you and of you. And it would not be enough that your word should have given this commandment with speech that had word not also shown the way with deeds. Therefore, I too follow his teaching with deeds and words. I do so under your wings and great indeed would be my peril, but that under your wings my soul is subdued, and my weakness is known to you. I am a little child, but my father lives forever, and my guardian is sufficient to me. For he who begat me and he who watches over me is one and the same. You are all my good things. You are almighty with me before I am with you. To such, therefore, as you bid me serve, I shall make known not what I was, but who I have now become and who I still am, nor do I judge myself. This, then, is how I would be heard. Romans 3, 10 through 12 says, quote, As it is written, there's no one righteous, not even one. There's no one who understands. There's no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one, unquote. So if you turn your spiritual eye inward to find the divinity, I'm afraid all you will find is darkness and utter darkness. However, if you seek, you will find. If you not, 
the door will be opened unto you. If you finally give up on any efforts you might make for self-salvation, then and only then will you lift your head up like Nebuchadnezzar in the grass and have your sanity restored unto you. The depths of the agnostic asylum are deep indeed, but there is a love in the universe that can find you even there, heal you, and plant divinity itself directly into the soil of your heart. What kind of soil? are you? Listen to how Augustine differentiates between his own good and evil. He reveals this truth, quote, quote, to such I will make myself known. Let them sigh with relief over my good things and with sorrow over my bad things. My good things are your statutes and your gifts. My bad things are my sins and your judgments, unquote. Staring inside, well, it'll bring you to despair. I guarantee it. Turning the inner sight outward towards the cross of Jesus Christ will start you towards your very own pilgrim's progress. I remember when I was spiritually dead, the coroner pronounced time of death over my selfish existence. And it was then when I turned my face towards my last and only hope that the inner physician came to visit my heart of stone and turned it to a heart of flesh. He took what was old and gave me something new. Christ is king. Hail to the king.